All right, folks, uh, we're going to get started here. This is a <clears throat> this is a very first attempt at a live stream into the TWIP community as well as to YouTube. Uh, I'm going to read my little intro here from my, my good friend, Photo Joseph. So basically in this interview, uh, Photo Joseph, YouTuber, he's going to join the show to discuss some important details about Panasonic's newest Micro Four Thirds camera, the Lumix GH6. Photo Joseph is a content creator, he's an educator, he's a YouTuber. He's been shooting since around the age of seven and he's been teaching and presenting on stage to audiences around the globe for about 30 years. And he runs an online resource for photo and video education over at photojoseph.com. Photo Joseph, welcome to the show, man. How's it going? It's going good. Thank you very much for having me on today. <laughs> yeah, man. You surprised me there. I didn't realize you're cutting to me. I was like, oh, look at that. I'm on. <laughs> He's like, wait, I'm doing my taxes over here. No, welcome. Welcome, man. Thanks for doing this. I'm, I'm excited yeah, to chat bro. with you about this. This is going to be an a interesting, interesting show. You and I both have uh, been involved with Lumix for quite some time. You probably longer yeah. than me, I think, but uh, you, you, I think deeper than me because you, like I said in that little intro, you run a YouTube channel that's all about stuff like this gear and video and cameras and all the, all the moons right. that orbit around those things. You talk about them on your YouTube channel. Let's start there before we dive into this camera stuff uh, for the folks sure. that may not be familiar with photo Joseph, give us a little bit of your backstory and the kind of stuff that you talk about on that, on that YouTube channel of yours. Yeah, absolutely. So these days, the primary focus is YouTube. The YouTube channel is Photo Joseph, of course, nice and easy to find. And it is really all about photo and video gear. These days, more video than still photography stuff, although every once in a while I do go back to the uh, back to the roots and play with that a little bit. Uh, so it's a lot of video content and live streaming. Live streaming is a big aspect of what I talk about. So the A temp hardware, you know, Yolo box stuff like that. There's tons of content around that. Yeah, it's just it's education based. Um, not, I sometimes do reviews. It's not really review centric. It's more education centric. Here's what this tool is. Here how it works. You can form your own opinion if you like it or not. That kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah. The real talk. I, I look at your channel as kind of a no BS almost you know i've said this to you before you're kind of the doc brown of cameras <laughs> <laughs> you just need a lab kit and some more hair you'd be good you'd be right <laughs> yeah, a lot more hair apparently <laughs> or just, just switch it just switch the beard put it on top of your <laughs> make it all white yeah perfect yeah, no? yeah, Working on the white, so. yeah. <laughs> get some gigawatts going you'll be good uh, but you know, the, obviously, the, the purpose of this this discussion is the Lumix GH6, which is the newest. And I have one here. I know you have one over there. This is the yeah. the Lu the newest uh, flagship camera in the Lumix Micro Four Thirds line of cameras, and it's got some notable differences. When I got this camera and the spec sheet for it, I looked at it as okay. It looks like Lumix has taken all of the cameras that were sort of video centric up to now like gh gh uh 5s or mark ii and and the box cameras and all these different things and even the s1 series with the full frame and the s5 and kind of taking the things that people loved about those cameras and put them in a micro four thirds camera and then did some magic to the sensor and some other algorithmic type computational stuff to enable some other features resulting in a camera that I think satisfied uh, satisfies a wider breadth of photographers or videographers out there. What mm -hmm. did you feel the same or is it am I am I just, you know, being a little fanboyish about it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think uh, I think you hit it pretty well there. It really does add adds a lot of features people have been waiting for. Uh, enhances on what was already there. It's just a really good, strong evolution of the camera and then adding features like ProRes internally. It's uh, that's pretty awesome in itself. So there's a lot of really good new features, a lot of enhancing of the original features and overall just, just a better camera. And one of the cool things I think is that it really does still focus on still photography as well. It's not just a video camera it is very much still also a still photographer's camera and i'm really looking forward to doing my first trip with it don't know when that'll be or where i'll go because you know we still don't get to do the travel like we used to but That's i'm looking right. forward to that to use it for both still and video because it does do both very very well so being able to switch back and forth has always been one of the strong points of the gh series but like this one with the the higher resolution sensor the bigger sensor and the not bigger but higher resolution and that crazy ridiculous 100 megapixel mode is uh, is pretty cool i'm looking forward to playing with that in the real world 
Yeah, yeah, me too. You know, and what and I want to I want to throw some hard questions at you because I know you and I have talked about the camera uh, or not not we haven't talked about this camera one on one yet, but we've talked about cameras in general. And I always value our conversations because it's not you're not the okay. I have to say nice things about this feature. Gloss over the lack of feature here. You're you're the no BS kind of brutally honest reviewer. So with that said, you mentioned photography, right? So when I look at this camera. Part of the the photographer in me thinks, okay, why why still micro four thirds? So Panasonic Panasonic has full frame out there. They got the S five on the lower end, and the S series on the higher end, and they're fully immersed in that full frame space. Yet they're producing these newer generation GH micro four thirds cameras. Why would someone want to go with a GH camera over just going for all the pixels and low light performance of full frame? Yeah, it's a great question, and it's actually a pretty easy answer, I think. It really comes down to size and weight, and to a degree, cost as well. But if you think about a bag of, let's say you're going to take, just let's say you're going pretty minimal. You're going to take one camera and a couple of lenses on a trip with you. Well, the bodies are not that different in size. You look at the GH6, compare it to the, the full-frame S5, and there really isn't much of a difference between size and weight. But then you start looking at the lenses and a 12 to 35 equivalent or a 100 to 300 or 200 or 400 equivalent, like those kind of those lenses get way bigger when they're full frame. So if you value carrying something that's smaller, lighter, easier to carry around all day, less weight on your back, and it's still going to give you stellar image quality, then Micro Four Thirds is still a really, really great choice. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder, I wonder that there's, you know, there's multiple camps out, out there, right? And we'll, we'll use the broad brush and paint them as the full frame crowd and the people that say, you know, full frame or go home. You're not a real photographer if you're not shooting full frame. And then there's the micro four thirds crowd that say, hey, micro four thirds is good enough. Do you think that good enough is a compromise? Is the, is the, the phrase, okay, micro four thirds can get you almost to where full frame get, gets you. Is that a fallacy or is that reality? Yeah, I, I don't like that term good enough for something yeah. like this. It's the right tool for the job. I mean, you, people are shooting professional work on an iPhone. How big is that sensor? It's tiny. Mm -hmm. So it's not about the sensor size. It's about, you know, what you do with it. <laughs> There's a joke in there. It's, you but, thought about that as it was coming out of your mouth. As you it was coming it. out of my mouth. I'm like, hey, that's really, that's good. <laughs> Bravo. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it's the right tool for the job. And, you know, yes, there are certainly advantages to a larger sensor, right? With a larger sensor, you get better low light performance. That is just physics. You have more space to gather the pixels. The photo sites are physically larger. Therefore, they are better performance. That, that's just that's just science and math, right? That's you can't argue that you get shallower depth of field at any given aperture. However, it's not to say that you don't still get excellent image quality and excellent shallow depth of field with the right combination of lens and sensor and so on. So there's, it's not a good enough. It's the right tool for the job. Yeah. And you know, you know, it, there's, there's a ton of reviews out there on your channel, Photo Joseph on YouTube about this camera and a number of our friends have done reviews on this camera. What are the, and so I won't, we're not going to make this, this discussion a review of exhaustive review of all the features, but I do want to talk about your favorite top line features of the camera. What makes the GH6 different? than the GH5 series before it, or even the other cameras, like we mentioned the S5 or the S1 and S1H. What makes it different? Sure. So probably number one for me would be the, the ability to shoot 4K60 at 422.10 bit. So for me, when I was shooting anything out in the field, forget about studio work, but out shooting, out vlogging, or just shooting in the field, whatever, I want the best quality. I'm always going to shoot logs, so I have the ability to do color grading. So that means I have to be in 10 bit. If I'm going to be in 10 bit, I really want to be in 422 because that's going to give me the best image quality out of that. I'm always going to shoot 4K. That's there's no question about that. And on the GH5 and prior cameras to this, your max at that stage was basically if you want a 422 and 10 bit, you're hitting at 30 frames and 4K. You're hitting at 30 frames per second, which is fine. But I always would prefer to shoot in 60 so that I have the ability to slow things down 50% and get that really smooth slow motion. And if I need to slow it more than that and I'm interpolating adding frames, then I'm only adding one frame every other frame instead of three if I wanted to go to 4x slow. So being able to shoot at 4K 60 and still have all that quality, that for me is the number one best capability of it. That's something that to me is absolutely wonderful. Um, it, obviously for different users, there's going to be different things. The ability to shoot 120 frames per second is going to be huge. Shooting ProRes is amazing. That's an amazing feature right there. 
uh, shooting open gate, although it's not technically new, that was in the GH5 as well, but the ability to shoot open gate is absolutely fantastic. So there's a lot of different features in there, but that 4K60 at the full quality, that for me is the big one. Yeah. Yeah. And then out of the box, you know, you mentioned in in the beginning, you mentioned that this the camera is equally capable for video and still photographers. But right. is it? So I want to dive into that a little bit, though. So the camera, when I got the camera, it felt like it was very much kind of leaning. If you, if you had a sliding scale in the 50 percent sure. mark in the middle with video on one side and still on the other side, it felt like it was skill. It skewed towards the video. Right. So sure. it skewed That's towards fair. this is a video camera that can do stills, but it's a video camera and it's targeted at people like you or people in Hollywood or making short films versus someone running around in a war zone taking pictures or doing landscapes and that sort of thing. Is there any water to that or is there any weight to that or is it equally capable at, at both? I mean, I wouldn't disagree that the emphasis of new features and exciting new features is on the video side. Yes, that is true, but it's also the best still micro four thirds camera that Panasonic has made. So if someone was shopping just for a still camera, it would be hard to say, oh, you should buy the GH6 over the G9, except that the G6 is a better still camera, but you are paying a lot extra for features that you don't need if all you care about is still photography. Mm -hmm. um, so that at that point, if you really just care about stills, that'd be a hard sell. But if you care about both, then the GH6 gives you the best in class of the video and also gives you the best in class of photo for still uh, for a micro four thirds sensor. Yeah, for the for the, the the folks out there that are that talk about bokeh all the time, right? Yeah. So we, it's physics when you talk about sensor size right. versus, you know, all the things that go into creating an image on that sensor, optics in the lens, etc. The one of the things that a lot of photographers hang their hats on or think is a a deal breaker is not being able to get quote shallow depth of field. You and I know that right. that's not true, but I want to have you address it on the micro four thirds sensor, that smaller sensor size without the benefit of say iPhone, small sensor computational assist right, to get course. the blurred background. What do, what do you say to those folks that are like, you know what, I like the micro four thirds system, the GH6 looks amazing, but I can't get past that small sensor size because I need shallow depth of field for my portraits, for my weddings, for all that stuff. What, what do yeah. you say to those folks? I would say rent the camera and lens and find out that you're wrong. <laughs> I, you're right. I mean, physically, you know, if you're going to do by the numbers, then obviously any given aperture and focal length combination, you are going to get shallower depth of field on a full frame. That's again, that's just physics. There's no working around that, but you can get lenses that are F 1.7, F 1.2, F 0.95. If you get into some third party lenses that, will give you that super, super shallow depth of field, even more than you might be used to with a conventional lens on a full frame. And so you get all that back. So there's, it, it's not an argument that's really worth having because you can get it, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and I wonder, you see, that's the thing. I wonder, and I, I'm, I love Micro Four Thirds system. I shoot both, I shoot full frame and Micro Four Thirds. The video that I was shooting was primarily on a on a rig that's that's an S5 with the whole mic assembly on top of it and it's been great right it's full frame all that um, and I love it. Then, then along comes the GH6. For the Fredericks out there that are like, "Hey, this this S5 is great. I'm using it. You know, it, it. I haven't hit my head on the ceiling of its capabilities yet. Now I have all this stuff with the GH6. Is it is it a worthy upgrade or is it an upgrade from an S5 to a GH6 or is it a side grade? Or are we talking two different galaxies completely? I mean, not two totally different galaxies, but they are two different planets if we're going to go with that analogy <laughs> uh they are different cameras I mean, the, the ga6 does do things that the s5 doesn't like well what i mentioned is my favorite feature right the 4k 60 uh 422 10 bit you can't do that internally on a g on an s5 so there's that yeah. there are other things that the gh6 does that the s5 does not so it's it's just it's a different camera. I mean, you, you can't really call it an upgrade or a side grade when it it's side grade, I guess you could, but you certainly don't call it an upgrade when you're talking about going down to a smaller sensor. It's just a different camera. It's a different yeah. class of camera. Yeah. yeah. And you know what's interesting about the whole micro four third system is the the breadth of lenses that are out there, right? Yeah. That that you can adapt to the the smaller flange or the shorter flange distance and to the micro four thirds mount. Not notwithstanding the Olympus lenses out there and the Panasonic. Uh, catalog of lenses, but 
the other lenses out there that you can slap on the front of this thing. What do you typically shoot with when you're out rent? Like you, you mentioned when you can travel, when your wings are no longer clipped, you're going to head out and travel again with this thing. What do you take with you? What's, what's your normal loadout? Well, there's no normal. I mean, you've seen my gear wall. There's no normal. <laughs> I know. People say, the what, what's, in your, you... what's in your camera bag? I'm like, uh, today? What are, you, what are you asking me here? I don't quite understand the question. Um, <laughs> does not compute. <laughs> it, it does not compute. It, it just depends on what I'm shooting. But I mean, I, I, you know, fortunately, I have a, kind of a ludicrous amount of gear to choose from. Part of it just being in the position that I am. I get a lot of gear from companies to review and to play with and so on. But one of the you're talking about the lens choices and one of the really cool things about micro four thirds we talked in the beginning about lens size and cost comparatively speaking to full frame so you've got third parties that are making excellent lenses for micro four thirds that are smaller and lighter and cost less than what their full frame equivalent would be so i'm gonna here i'm gonna sh pick up a rig here it's a little bit ridiculous but this is a gh6 let me get this a little bit closer this is a gh6 currently rigged out um, with a small rig cage. So this is small rigs, new GH6 cage. And the lens that's on here is made by Makey. See if I take this off, can you see? Now I've got a filter on there. You can't see the manufacturer name through it, but it's Makey. This is a, I forget what this one is. Um, this is a 35 millimeter F1 or T, T 1.2. T, where is it? Find the thing, T2.2. So this is part of a kit that they sent me. It's an eight lens kit that I'm doing some videos on right now. And these are all, well, you can see, let me print this back up again. You can see it's geared. Uh, let's, let's see, which way can I show it? So you can actually see the gears. There you go. You can see the gears on it. And yep. here I have a follow focus system and the driver for that here and so on. And so this, this is a cine style lens, right? It's labeled as a cine style lens. It has the focus gears. It's obviously all man manual, all mechanical. The aperture is stepless. So if you need to change the aperture during a shot, you get that smooth transition. And the optical quality is fantastic. And the cost is extremely affordable. So lenses like that, I absolutely love. If I'm doing video work, I like using the follow focus system. I like being able to rack the focus as slowly or quickly and as accurately as I want, being able to set an A point and a B point very quickly. And from the remote here, this is the um, uh, Tilta system, the Nucleus, what is it? Nucleus Nano system. Yeah, Tilta Max, Nucleus Nano. So on here, when you're focusing, I hit a button. So I'd rack to my front, my near focus point, hit a button, rack to my back, you know, find it, fine tune it, find it, hit the back. And now I can go, <laughs> full range to go exactly point to point. I love that. So that for any kind of work is just awesome to be able to do. So I do that. Then there's like the anamorphics, right? You've got Sure made these anamorphic lenses from Micro Four Thirds that are just beautiful. They're great lenses, very low cost for anamorphic. And you've got a whole suite of those lenses. I did a video on those a while ago. Unfortunately, I don't still have those lenses. They they wanted them back. But uh, but that's another great option that doing that in full frame, it gets a lot more expensive. There's just so many different lens options. Yeah, yeah, I know. And it's crazy. It's like going to a, I know you can go to a, a lot of my friends go to a camera store, like an old used camera store, and you can find vintage lenses and then adapt them to the to the micro four third system and go that way. Yeah. So on that, you're 100% true. However, adapting vintage lenses that are almost universally made for full frame cameras to micro four thirds, you end up cutting out the, you're only using the center of the lens. And so for a lot of these vintage lenses, the whole reason you want it is for the character, the the bokeh, the character around the edges, the, the chromatic aberration that happens with them, the way it may vignette and so on. And when you're only using the center part of it, you do lose a lot of that. So if you mm. are adapting old lenses, it actually is better to do that on full frame. And I've gotten actually, quite into that for full frame um like these what are these super tacomar so i've been buying these super tacomar lenses on ebay and this is one of my latest ones and this is uh what is this thing i even remember it's sitting here so i can remember to buy a gear for it. oh this is an 85 millimeter f 1.8 and look mm. at how small this thing is right this is yeah. tiny That's so beautiful. this adapted to full frame which the adapter is actually almost as big as the lens which is kind of silly but whatever that goes on there and then i'll put a gear a 3d printed gear on it so i can use it with a focus rack system and now you've got these really vintage looks on them and so that if that's your thing then it is still better to go full frame so you're using the full sensor yeah you know one <clears throat> excuse me one of one of the things that uh, i wanted to touch on have my notes to talk to you about is the the reimagining of the articulated lcd on the back of the camera mm -hmm. right and and a lot of people have been commenting on that as it being kind of the the next step 
of or answering all the the issues that photographers have raised about having an articulated LCD, in particular being able to adjust it to what, 20, 30 degrees down without having it off to the side of the camera. Was that important to you to have that have that feature yeah, as a video person? It is. And it's more it's more so part of it is the ability to have it flip out like you said. So let me see. there's so much stuff on here it's a little bit hard to see and appreciate. But so let me see if I can get this close to the frame here. Let me pull it down. So there it's flat and as oops as i pull it out it stops a little bit and then you pull out farther so it's not quite flat flat right but you can look down at it and see it which in itself is great but here's why this is really important so let me fold it out like this <laughs> it's a little hard to see so it's full on straight down it is sticking out to the side here's yep. why this is important that it flips out the way. now i'm gonna have to turn this around a little bit but it clears the ports so typically on, a, on an LCD that doesn't go to the right side, that doesn't pop out like this, it doesn't clear the ports. You've got your HDMI, USB-C, audio ports, and so on all along here. And if it doesn't clear those, then you can't flip out the LCD, flip it up sideways when you've got stuff plugged into it. That historically is a problem with flip out LCD. So this resolves that issue. Is that it pops out like that and why that's so important. Yeah. Yeah, what, what kind of stuff do you shoot? I mean, look at that rig. I mean, that crazy rig you have. What what are you what are you shooting? Um, <laughs> so you're playing a video now. Is this is this your video? Or what is this one? This is from the Panasonic uh, announce video. Oh, okay. All right. I guess I hadn't seen that yet. Um, <laughs> what am I shooting? So this is rigged up actually for a it's a YouTube video that I'm working on right now that is about shooting open gate. So the idea behind open gate is you're using the full sensor, you're shooting a quote unquote square image, it's a four three aspect ratio image, so that you can easily crop a 16 by nine or a nine by 16 out of the same frame. You know, if you think about shooting normal widescreen 16 by nine video, but you also need to deliver vertical video for your client, trying to crop a nine by 16 vertical out of a 16 by nine horizontal, you're talking about using a tiny little sliver of the frame. And so reframing and actually getting a usable shot yeah, forget about it. But when you're talking about a virtually square image that you can crop out of, you have a lot more flexibility. And so this is an idea that's not new, but I'm very, I was very happy to see in some of the GH5 reviews that that was talked about. And so it was kind of one of those, all right, the world is finally starting to see this. Now let's really push it. And so I'm working on this video to talk about that feature. So this rig is there because I shot, let's call it a, a social media commercial or something for a local business. And I, I reached out to them and said, Hey, can I do this for you? Uh, you know, no charge to you guys. I just want access and be able to shoot what's a commercial and I'll give them the final product. But that is for this video that I'm working on about how to shoot open gate and then how to edit it and so on. So that's why the rig is like that. And this was just right mm -hmm. there is another really cool feature that I took advantage of on this camera. So this is the XLR one that's on here. And right now there's only one plugged in, but there's a uh, one of my AVX Sennheiser receivers on here. So you can plug two of them into here. Plus simultaneously, because the GH6 does four channel audio, I have a little shotgun on here that's plugged into the 3.5 millimeter port. So this allows me to record four channels of audio. And so for this piece, I was in the kitchen with two chefs. Each one of them had a mic. So they're going to separate channels on the XLR1. And then I had the shotgun to get the ambient, the chopping, the you know stirring, all those ambient sounds that I want to get. Those are on a separate channel. So with one camera, I'm able to get two separate tracks of dialogue plus the ambient without having to have a separate recorder. That's unheard of in a camera like this. So that's a really, really cool feature right there. Yeah, that's one of those features where people are like, you know what? I wish it would do this thing, right? And it seems like it's, you know, of course, there are technical reasons why Panasonic didn't enable it, whatever, but they've enabled it. Just to put a finer point on that, the XLR1, you probably, the folks that are watching this probably couldn't see what it was in that that's rat that rat's nest of equipment you have right there. <laughs> but the, the XLR1 is a little thing that sits in the hot shoe. It, play, it slides into the hot shoe on GH cameras. And yeah, yeah ahead, that, the back, that guy without the little thing sticking up on the side with the blue tip on it. So it's that. And that allows you to run two XLR line level inputs into the camera directly. So you can mic up two people. And what Joseph was saying is not only can you do that, but the the audio jack on the camera itself doesn't get disabled when you put the XLR one on there. Now it stays hot and you can get two channels from that as well, the left and right stereo channel. So you end up with, if you want, four 
mono channels, right? Or two mono channels in one stereo pair. Is that, am I hitting that right? Yep, exactly. Yeah, you can split it however you want. So the 3.5 mil input is technically stereo, but most mics you'd plug into it are mono mic, so you get what we'd call dual mono. You get the same thing on the left and the right channel. But if you plug a stereo microphone into it, so a mic that actually has two mics on it, then those would go to the left and right channel. Or you could take a splitter. So if you wanted to do a four-person interview and each one mic separately, you absolutely could do that. You just get a little stereo splitter so you take two mono mics plugged into the splitter and that feeds into the left right of the 3.5 mil and then the xlr ones on top of that so you could you could actually record four totally independent channels of audio and when you look at the settings on the camera you can choose how you want the audio map do you want it to be uh do you want them to be all four separate do you want to mix them together you have a lot of options with how you set up your audio input and your monitoring which is that in itself is really cool when you're monitoring so like when i was shooting this you know i had headphones on obviously and so i can hear what's going on and on the lcd i can choose do i want to listen to just the xlr do i want to just the the 3.5 mil inputs do i want to listen to it all together so you can choose what you want to hear which is really cool yeah you you know the um which is you know that's another that's one of those little things that i think panasonic didn't push enough because it, because that kind of goes to the content creator world right because i remember you know, maybe a couple of years ago, if I wanted to do a multiple person interview, you know, with my camera, I had to figure it out with with a with a Zoom H whatever, right. you know, and run mics into it and then match up the audio later in Final Cut or Premiere, whatever, and then, you know, go to town. Now you can run them all into the camera and have that master file with everything already there and already synced up and, and nothing nothing to worry about on the post side, which is really yeah, interesting to me. It's easier. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so on, you're one of the few people I know that is, I, depending on the day, you know, I could look at you and you're a photographer, I look at you the next day, you're a videographer, a videographer, a filmmaker, right? So do you, how do you configure your cameras, your, your Panasonic cameras? Are you using the C modes or the custom modes on there to like, mm. okay, today I'm a photographer, switch it to custom photo mode, or today I'm doing slow motion, put it there, or today I'm doing cinematography with this LUT, put it there. Do you do you yeah. take it to that level, or is it more on the fly? Well, not quite in the sense of, oh, today I'm doing this, tomorrow I'm doing that type of a mode, but I do use the C modes a lot. I will often dial in different, I'll program a different C mode for a particular shoot. I know that on this shoot, I want to jump between this set of settings and this one and this one. So I'll reprogram them for that. So I don't have kind of a, it's always there in C1. I don't really have it that way. But if I'm going on location, then I will dial in the different settings that I think I'm going to need so I can switch between them easily. And then obviously you can tweak it once it's in there. Oh, so I do you're doing, use the it, you're doing it on like per trip. Are you doing it per trip? Like, okay, I'm going to, oh, yeah. I'm going to wherever. So let me set up the C mode for this particular thing that I may be shooting. Cause I, I'm, I'm more of a, yeah, absolutely. that seems crazy to me. Cause I'm like, you know, I have like th these three main modes that I shoot in, like I said, still video or slow-mo. Right. And I can switch between those. Okay. But you're not doing that. You're like, OK, what what like clothes? What am I going to wear today? OK, let me set the. <laughs> yeah. If. <laughs> yeah, pretty much the way to put it. It's basically like putting on an outfit. What am I going to put on? What cameras? <laughs> yeah. What lenses? What C? What am I going to program into my C modes? Yeah. yeah. No, that's about right. One place where it is consistent is my cameras in studio. There I have the C modes programmed for and it's for multiple cameras at once. I can go through and change them for a particular setup. So for example, whenever I'm shooting anything of a black magic ATEM, the lights will flicker, the buttons will flicker. So I have to adjust the shutter angle to 200 and I think it's 218 or 212 degrees to get it so that it doesn't flicker. So, and that's multiple cameras. So those are all set up in a particular way. If I'm using that setup for a live shoot, then I don't want to have the log footage. So I need to have, um, I either put it into a, I'm still kind of playing with this setup, whether I use one of the built-in color modes or just turn the LUT on, on the HDMI out, but that's in another C mode. So I go through all the cameras and put them all to C5 for live, and then they all have the same settings. So there I use the C modes and they're consistent. But when I'm out and about, you know, it changes all the time. Yeah, it's so cool. It's cool. It's always good talking to people and, 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 and kind of figuring out what their loadout looks like. Like when I when I think about you and your studio there, I, I feel like it's the Batcave, right? It's just it kind of is. E everything that you could possibly want to make content is in that spot where you are. And then I look less, at me, I'm, I'm more of a, but it's still the Batcave. It's still the Batcave. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I'm more of the uh, like minimalist. Like, what can I what can I get rid of so I can have less gear floating around? What is there like as we wrap this up, Joseph? What is what is your loadout look like from a from a high level? I mean, don't go exhaustively through all the gear that you have there, but studio. What are you using studio wise for camera and lens? And then when you're just kind of running out and about and you just want to do some street photography, for example, what do you take with you? And then when you're traveling and doing pro level jobs, obviously it, it varies depending on what the, what the nature of the gig is, but generally speaking, what do you take with you? So, okay. So in studio it's BGH ones. I, I replaced all my, so I used to shoot with a mishmash of, I had some GH5, a couple G9s, I think it all GH4. And that was my live and recorded studio rig. And so I, last year I swapped, or yeah, last year I swapped all those out with BGH ones. So there's five BGH ones that are my primary system in the studio. And those I try not to take out of the studio, but they do still tend to come out quite a bit. Like for example, when I did the project on this, because I needed not just the footage from the restaurant, a uh, shot with the GH6. I also needed all the behind the scenes. I actually took three of the BGH ones, put them in the restaurant, kind of up high, wide shot, and just with time code sync across all cameras, just let them roll the whole time so that I have, I don't know, four or five hours of multi camera uh, views from those three cameras. So those are great for something like that. The, if I'm just going out shooting still photography, I was talking about the vintage lenses and how much I love those. So if I'm just doing something just for fun, Odds are I'm going to grab the S5 and a vintage lens just because I just I just love the looks of those. Yeah. But if I was going to go on a trip like the last couple of really good trips I did, like India, we're talking about 2019, uh, the India trip, and I went to Taiwan, and those, I was taking the Micro Four Thirds. I think I was carrying G9s or GH5 back then, and a couple of the zoom lenses, you know, like the the 12 to 60, and what did I have? A uh, uh, 50 to 200. That's a beautiful lens on. The micro four thirds so that's a 100 to 400 equivalent and that just that's an incredible range between those two lenses you got a huge range and i think i had the 8 to 18 as well so i had 8 to 18 12 to 60 and 50 to 200 i think that was the, the trio so that's a relatively small lightweight package and it's a huge range right you're talking 16 yeah. to 400 millimeter range between the three lenses so it's kind of everything you would possibly need so if i'm sh if i'm traveling where i don't know what i'm going to get like i'm not doing it for a specific and go with as wide of a variety so I can cover any angle. Um, if it's specific, like, well, okay, so I did something for Sure a while ago, did a video on theirs, and those are obviously, those are Micro Four Thirds, and so those I shot with the BGH-1 because I had it all rigged out in there, and that was kind of a specific project to show off. Um, now I'm doing these videos with the Makey lenses, that's all GH6 because that's the new hotness. So yeah, you know, it, it, yeah. it varies, but yeah, that gives you an idea. You know, you know, interesting. I know you're, you're I think you were the one that got me turned on to the ATM or the ATEMs, you know, from mm -hmm. Blackmagic. Um, and I use them from time to time. I'm not using it right now. I'm using a BG, uh, the BGH1 with the XLR1 on top of it right now for this rig. Um, yeah. But I'm not running it into an ATEM. I'm using software instead. What I know, you know, and I've done some interviews with the Blackmagic folks and I know their Blackmagic cinema cameras are designed specifically, of course, and obviously to work with right. their ATEMs with the tally sure. light and all that stuff to control them. Are, do you feel like you're giving anything up using a BG series camera and plug it into the ATEM? Do you wish for anything? Sure. It, it, it's, it's an interesting question there. If I was going to build, if I was going to build a live streaming rig, especially, especially a portable rig, like I want to build a kit that I can take on location, like say it's, I'm selling the service of live streaming your events, then I would probably use the Blackmagic cameras for that because you do have the camera control from the ATEM and it's really straightforward and easy. Um, but you don't have everything, right? You, you have some control of the camera, but not complete control of the camera. If you want complete control of the camera, then the BGH ones are better for that because you can tether them over software and you have absolutely every piece of control over the camera from software that you would if you're standing at it physically. So there's some advantages there. And so what for what I'm doing, I love having the BGH ones because first they have a lot more features. I can do things like shutter angle, uh, like um, uh, synchro scan, which is critical for the work that I do, being able to dial in the precise shutter angle. Uh, 
custom white balance. You can't do that from the Blackmagic cameras from the software. You, I think you can do it. For, yeah, you can do it from the camera itself, but not through the software. So there's too many things I'd have to be running back and forth for. But for again, for a if I was going to build a business doing live streaming events, then the Blackmagic cameras would be great for that. There's no arguing that. Plus yeah. things like the ability to record the raw B raw internally on the cameras automatically. I mean, that is really nice. There's no doubt that that's a nice feature, yeah. but you can, you can do similar. I mean, you can record internally on the BGH ones or any other Lumix camera. You could record to ProRes raw if you hook up a Ninja five to it. So you do have those options. It's just, there's convenience at it with the black magic setup. There's you know, no arguing that. Yeah. Yeah. No, of course. Of course. Um, I'm going to take a couple of questions before we break here. I got one last question of my own for you. You okay. you uh, you mentioned the, the zoom range that you shoot with conventional wisdom back in the day. You know, obviously things have improved over the last couple of decades, but the conventional wisdom used to be zoom lenses are soft. Right. And well. real photographers that want ult ultimate quality out of the sensors that they spend all that money on are going to shoot with prime or fixed focal length lenses. What are, what's your, what's your school of thought on that? I, soft is definitely not an issue, but quality overall, actually, I wouldn't even say quality. It's more, it's more aperture range at a specific focal length for compared to size and money. Does that make sense? Like for, mm -hmm. for a given amount of money, you can get a wider aperture fixed focal length lens than you would get zoom. Right. The, most zoom lenses are, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of zoom lenses are variable aperture. And so that's often disappointing to have a variable aperture lens, but then you have plenty that are fixed aperture, but they cost more. So a fixed aperture zoom lens is going to cost quite a bit more than an obviously fixed aperture prime lens, non, a non-zoom lens. So there's a big money difference in there. If you're trying to build out the best quality kit at the lowest price possible, then sure, buying prime lenses would be a better route to go. I think you'll get you'll get a better selection of wide aperture glass if you just buy a couple of prime lenses, but then you're giving up a lot of flexibility of the zoom. If you can afford to buy the the fixed prime, uh, sorry, the fixed aperture zoom lenses, then there you're getting kind of the best of everything. Yeah. 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 I think the answer is always it depends, right? <laughs> it's well, yeah. Like, it's yeah, always absolutely. it depends. Uh, let's take a, a couple questions before we break here. And thanks yeah, for, I see thanks a couple for taking in the, time. In the chat here. Yeah. Nathan, Nathan says, thanks for this great conversation. I'm looking to possibly get a second camera to my GH5S and I'm on the fences between the BGH1, which is my baby here, and the GH6, which is this one. Uh, what would you advise as a straight buy? It depends. <laughs> <laughs> the, the BGH1 is a phenomenal camera for a specific use case. Right? The way that I'm using it here, it's brilliant. It's You can power it over PoE+. Plus. So you've got an Ethernet cable to power the camera, and then you can control that camera over software from anywhere on the network. So for my setup, where I have five cameras, I can reach out to all five cameras from my laptop and control each one individually. That's that's enormous right there. You don't get that on anything else. So if you need that or you want that, that's huge. They are physically smaller and lighter without because they don't have the screen on them. So that makes it a lot easier to put up in the rafters somewhere. And again, because of the ability to control it and see through the camera as well through software, if you need to stick a camera up in the corner and then position it exactly right, that is so much easier to do when you're looking at the image through a laptop. You know, that kind of thing is just fantastic. So if you need that, then there's no question. Yeah. If you're talking about a camera for run and gun, if you're the kind of shooter who wants to rig up your gear, rig it up, right? Meaning you wanna put it in a cage, you wanna put on a, an external monitor with potentially a recorder on it, you wanna build a follow focus system around it. In that case, the BGH1 is awesome for that, right? Because you have to build it up. You have to add an LCD monitor to it or else you can't see what you're shooting. You probably are going to want to add some kind of handle. Otherwise, this is kind of awkward box to hold. It's designed to be rigged up. If, on the other hand, you want a camera that you can just grab and shoot without having to add anything to it, well, the BGH1 is definitely not that. In that case, the GH6, because it's obviously completely self-contained. It's got the LCD. It's got the handle. It's got everything. You just All you need is a lens, and you're good to go. So it just depends on what you're doing and what you need. If you're you know, the BGH1, you can rig in a car easier. It's smaller, so you can stick it in the back of the the uh, rear windshield, whatever you call that. You know, there's you can position it in different places more easily. It's easier to mount outside of the camera, outside of the car, things like that. BGH1 is a winner. 
again, yeah. depends on what you need. It depends. Okay. Yeah, it all. Yeah, it definitely. It always depends. And it's. Is it? Am I correct? And I, I think I read something about the BGH one because they're the BGH one has been incremented up. But the BGH one was the first micro four thirds camera to be Netflix certified. Is that that's correct? Right. The, yes. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I believe it. I'm is. saying yeah. that as I'm as I'm checking my brain cells, but I'm I'm quite sure that's right. Yep. Yeah. Look me up. Fact check me on that. Um, let's take another question. Uh, this one is from Razor2048. Razor says, I wonder how much have Micro Four Thirds sensors improved over the years in terms of high ISO performance? Great question. Yeah, absolutely. Have they improved? Absolutely. So every iteration, they're always getting better and better at the higher ISO, for sure. If you're looking for the best high ISO performance, then that is still the GH5S because it has the dual native sensor. And when you're shooting log, I think it's higher base ISO is 2000. I think that's right. Mm -hmm. So at 2000 ISO, you're getting something that is as good as its lower base ISO, which I believe is 400. I'd have to check. Don't quote me on that. But uh, let's just call it 400 and 2000 for the sake of discussion. So at that level, you're talking about phenomenal ISO at its native ISO. Then you've got a camera like the GH6, which doesn't have dual native, but it does have the high uh, high dynamic range features, not like HDR, but what's it called? Dynamic range boost is the name of it. Yeah, and right. dynamic range boost does something really, really interesting where it takes data from, um, from photo cells at kind of a lower ISO and ones at a higher ISO and blends them together to give you this best of both worlds image. And when you're shooting in that mode, your lowest ISO is 2000. So it's it's kind of it's not technically accurate to call it a, a new base ISO because it's simultaneously shooting at like 400 and 2000 or something like that. But that is the lowest you can set it to. So you could think about it like that. Um, and that is a phenomenally clean image. It's a really, really good image. So yeah, the, the answer to the question is absolutely. The sensors have gotten dramatically better. Um, I don't know when the last time Nathan saw or, or Razor saw one of these uh one of these cameras and looked at the high ISO performance, but they're absolutely getting better all the time. And features like dual native or this dynamic boost are uh, dynamic range boost really make a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy what they're doing these days. Um, last question, I think for me, um, before we wrap up is, you know, I plugged the, the GH6 and what was it? I think it was the S5. I plugged them in because you can direct connect, you know, through USB-C into the Mac and it just shows up as a camera at that point. Um, and like you were saying, you can run the Lumix Tether software and, and manipulate the settings in the, so in the camera and all that stuff to get a preview. Um, but I wasn't getting audio. Is there, am I doing something wrong or does audio not pass through USB-C when, yeah, when you're it, connected that way? Yeah, and it's, that's not a unique thing with the Lumix cameras. Any camera that's got a webcam mode, apparently, from what I understand, it's the same way. I don't... Mm someone explained to me the technical reason why once I don't remember what it is now, but, but you're not doing anything wrong. If you're using it as a webcam and that means you're using the webcam plugin. So there's a, a download for, to turn your Lumix camera into webcam. And then it just shows up as a webcam yep. in your um, zoom or you know, Skype or whatever. Uh, yeah. Audio doesn't come with it. Unfortunately, that's, it's just the nature of that beast. Like I said, apparently it's that way with all of them. Yeah. Oof. All right. Well, good. I'm glad. I thought I literally was pulling what little hair I have out left. Yeah. <laughs> I have left out. I'm like, okay, where's the setting? How come audio's not coming through? Um, but I didn't know. So now I know. Um, mm -hmm. Joseph, thanks for doing this, man. Thanks for, for letting me pick your brain about this camera. I think it's an important camera for Panasonic. Um, the, I think the last wrap up question, I think uh, it's on a lot of people's minds is Panasonic's product line continues to expand with the S series, GH series, BG series, right? There's a lot of choices out there in the line. And obviously the, the answer to which camera should I buy is always gonna be, it depends. But generally speaking, who are the, the different lines for? Like, in other words, let me put a finer point on it. If obviously the BG cameras are more for a production environment, like you said, you want to stick cameras in different places or you're doing Netflix documentaries, you want to stick the camera someplace cheaply, relatively cheaply at that budget level, you can do it with the BG camera. But then when you step, things get a little bit more cloudy for me when you step into the S series, like the S5 and now the GH6 and the, and the, the GH5 Mark II and all those, for someone like Nathan and Razor in the chat here, for someone that's looking at this line saying, it's an embarrassment of choices. I have analysis paralysis. I'm sure. not gonna get anything right now. I'm just gonna wait, right? What, what do you <laughs> tell those people? I mean, you can wait forever. There's always gonna be something better. 
right? There's always going to be something better coming. It reminds me of, of a, a time when I was I used to work at Apple, as you obviously know, and yep. sat down on a plane. It was always my... I always hated that moment when the person next to you goes, so what do you do for a living? I'm like, oh God, because as soon as I say I work for Apple, there's going to be a million questions. Mm -hmm. And I remember one time um, before I learned to say I work for a small tech company, um, I said I worked at Apple and the guy said, um, oh, so are they working on a new laptop? And I just stared at him and he goes, that's a dumb question, isn't it? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Of course, they're working on a new whatever. Obviously, no. Apple just decided that you know what the last computer is the best we'll ever make, so we're just going to stop here. You're going to hang it up. Always <laughs> something coming. Always. Yeah. So yeah. you buy when you need it. I always told people I said same thing with a camera as with a computer. It, maybe this relevant this is a little bit more relevant to a computer, but buy the best that you can possibly afford at the last minute you possibly can, and it will last you the longest. Right. Mm -hmm. If you buy the lowest end gear within a year or two, you're going to want to swap it out. Same thing on a camera. If you're like, oh, what I really want is the S5 full frame, let's say, but all I can afford is a used GH5. Well, are you going to be able to afford that S5 in a couple of months? Maybe it's worth waiting for it because that S5 will last you longer. Do you need the camera right now? And all you can afford is the used GH5? Then get the used GH5. You know, get what you can, make money with it. And when it's time, you can upgrade the gear. Choosing between full frame and micro four thirds, that's just a personal decision. I mean, you have to decide what it is you're actually doing. You know, if you're going to shoot, if you want to shoot with Cook anamorphic lenses, then you're probably going to want to be on full frame, get the S1H or the BS1H, and that's going to give you that full on cinema style look. Uh, if you want something run and gun, small and lightweight, I mean, it's pretty hard to argue with a, a GH6 with any of these, you know, the Makey lenses or the, uh, the Suray lenses. If you want something for travel, lightweight and easy, again, lightweight. Micro Four Thirds is pretty sweet for that. If you love vintage lenses and that's where you want to go, well, you're going to get a better look out of the full frame. Go with the S5 or or the S1 for that. Just, yeah, yeah just depends on what you're doing. Yeah, it does. It does depends. And you know, and, and people say, yeah, the S5. If you hold the S5 and a GH6, you know, side by side, the weight and size are negligible, body only. Yeah, difference, but yeah. it's the glass, right? We yeah. put the glass on these things. The Micro Four Thirds glass is eeny beeny, tiny, high quality. And full frame glass obviously is going to be going to be bigger, right? Yeah, yeah. Do you suggest people like you like on the on the whole calculus of if you can afford to wait a couple months buy something better? Um, how do you factor in lens purchasing into that? Because I know it used to be the conventional wisdom used to be put all your money in glass because that's going to sure. last you know forever and ever, and right. buy a, a relatively cheap or cheaper body. You know, or in other sure. in other words, put the emphasis on the glass. Do you agree with that? Oh yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. And another thing about glass is that you can rent. So if you yeah. need a particular lens for a specific event, but it's not the kind of thing that you really need all the time, rent it. The rental market is amazing. The fact that you can rent these lenses for pennies on the dollar versus owning, and if you're renting it, it's a lot easier to bill that to your client. Uh, you know, it's you certainly can bill, and people should do this if you're work doing client work. You should be renting your gear there should be a gear fee in your invoice but that can be harder to justify it can be harder to explain it also makes it easy to just knock that off if you're trying to haggle over price or the clients try to haggle over price but if you actually rent something it's very easy to include that on there look i spent you know 200 on renting this lens for the week uh here it is on the invoice with a 20 percent markup that's mm -hmm. totally normal so it becomes easier to build a client for it and then you're not only not out of money for buying it you can actually profit on it because you're gonna mark it up yeah all right well we're looks like the bandwidth gods are starting to frown on us i'm starting to lose you a little bit so let's, let's wrap it up here joseph if people want to connect with you and follow you online what's a what's a good place for them to punch into their browser photo joseph everywhere you can just go to photojoseph.com for the main website youtube.com slash photo joseph photo joseph on twitter it's photo joseph just type that into your browser you'll find it all right. Awesome, man. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate you doing this. It's kind of a last minute thing. Thanks for coming on and thanks for putting up with me kind of with this experimental this live stream to the YouTube channel and into the TWIP community. And it awesome. seems to have seems to have worked. So I'm Good. excited. Good. Yeah. Glad to hear cool. it. Cool. All right, man. We'll leave it right there. Thank thanks a lot. And uh, and travel safe whenever you get on a plane again. <laughs> NAB. Are you going? I am going to NAB. I'll see you there. Cool.
See you I'll there. Let you, you know, I will let you buy Thank me you. a drink in NAB. How about that? Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. Let's cross all the fingers and toes because that's still a month and change away. You know, anything could happen. Anything but. can happen. Yeah. Yeah. Anything. Yeah. So knock on wood, cross fingers and toes and eyes and all that stuff. And, you yeah. know, if all works, I will see you in Las Vegas. We'll go Sounds good. Take care. Buddy. All right, man. All right. Take care. See everybody. Thanks for joining.